Welcome to Diesel Catalyst Systems, Diesel Oxidation Catalyst and DPF. My name is Tony Salas, here to discuss pretty much these new emission control systems used on diesel. Well, not exactly new, but they've been updated. So let's get started. Emission requirements have brought about the need of enhanced fuel systems, but also the introduction of diesel oxidation catalysts and diesel particulate filters on your trucks. This is part of our objective for today. So retrofits have been used too, and they are installed on early trucks and buses in order to meet the state requirements on fleet emissions. This web presentation will familiarize you with DOC and DPF operation. Discussion will take place on how manufacturers are enabling a regeneration event and components they are using to monitor them. Now data analysis will be viewed on pressure, temperature, and in certain models oxygen sensors where they are used, especially on Dodge Cummins applications. Focus will be on regeneration, why it occurs, engine behavior, and effects of these systems and effects on drivability. So these slides will illustrate plumbing on various OE platforms and a look at retrofit systems that are available as well. So let's keep going. Well, skipping the legal mumbo jungle, it comes down to what it comes to emissions. I mean, why are we using these very expensive and very high maintenance, in some cases, diesel oxidation catalyst, diesel particular filter, and selective catalyst reduction? Well, the whole purpose is to reduce soot, in this case, the reduction of particulate matter, that black stuff we have traditionally seen on exhaust pipes. As you look at the tip, you'll see that black. That pretty much is not good for the environment. That is particulate matter, a.k.a. known as soot, along with the biggie one, which is the reduction in NOx. NOx probably rings a bell with some of you with the use of EGR valves, but it is something that they're going after and requiring quite a lot of bit of reduction. And there is more to what has changed in today's diesels, but what about crankcase gases? Yeah, we've now gone to closed case ventilation system or crankcase ventilation systems that are closed. Well, as you look at this slide here, you're going to see that the emission standards have really dropped as you look from you know, Euro 2, 1996, and I was, if we go from the big to the small here, we will see quite a drop in uh, pretty much in the demands for reduction. What is that the government's calling for along with California Aresis Board? You can see that there's a reduction for NOx and a reduction for soot. So what we're just trying to illustrate here is the fact that diesel is under the gun to have drastic emission reductions, especially when it comes to soot and NOx. Well, when we talk about emission controls, there's what we refer to as pre-combustion versus post-combustion emission control. The EGR was used primarily to reduce NOx, pretty much the one that we've seen in a lot of different diesels and gasoline vehicles as well. Subcooled gases from the coolers allowed the gas to act as a heat sink to reduce the NOx. In other words, we cool those gases down so when they're recirculated through the intake, they help reduce the NOx. In other words, the way of reducing NOx is to reduce that combustion temperature. This was accomplished before the combustion process using the EGR. Now when you look at NOx, and we discussed NOx 101 here, you should understand that 79% of what's in the atmosphere is nitrogen, and less than 18% is oxygen. But when you get those two, nitrogen and oxygen, at about 2500 degrees, they are fused together as a compound element, thus forming NOx. Now the X represents many uh, versions of oxides of nitrogen, but it all comes down to that they're fused together as a compound element. So the basic secret to reduce NOx is to keep it cool. What do we mean by that? Is before the combustion event occurs, so we're trying to cool the combustion chamber. Now, I don't like to cover too technical because I don't want to pretty much put you to sleep, but uh, technically speaking, it's just telling you here that why is NOx so bad, you know, and you're welcome to pause and read this slide, but it all pretty much means that we're trying to reduce NOx. So we see nitrogen and we see oxygen in the atmosphere, and when those get hot over 2,500 degrees, we start to form NOx. Then at that point, that goes into the air and thus goes after the ozone layer. So as it's shown in the middle bullet, it says or in atmospheric chemistry, the term NOx means the total concentration of NO and NO2, which are oxides of nitrogen, and during daylight, these concentrations are all in equilibrium. The ratio of uh, NO and NO2, as I just said there, is determined by the intensity of the sunshine, which converts NO2 to NO, and the concentration of ozone, which reacts with NO to again form NO2. 
So in the presence of excess oxygen, O2, nitric oxide reacts with the oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide, and O2, and the time required depends on the concentration in the air. It all just means pretty much that we need to understand that we need to reduce NOx by reducing those temperatures. If not, we create excess oxides of nitrogen, which will react with the ozone in the air, and that's pretty much a pretty serious issue that's going on. So when we look at after treatment systems, here we can see a Ford power stroke and quite a lot of components here we have uh, basically, and it comes down to the oxidation catalyst and the DPF, diesel particulate filter. Now many of these trucks, depending what year model we're talking about, uh, pretty much have been blamed for poor fuel economy because of frequent regenerations. Well that is true, but is there a way to reduce regenerations and pretty much improve fuel economy? And the answer is yes. Now, in order to continue learning about these after-treatment systems, there's something called SER, aka known as Selective Catalytic Reduction. It is a means of converting nitrogen oxides, also referred to as NOx, with the aid of catalysts into diatomic nitrogen N2 and water in H2O. A gaseous reductant, typically anhydrous ammonia, aqueous ammonia, or urea, is added to a stream of fluor exhaust gas that is absorbed into a catalyst Carbon dioxide is a reaction product when urea is used as a reductant. So what is it trying to say there? What we're trying to say is that we inject urea, which is water mixed with, uh, excuse me, which is urea mixed with water, and in this case you have it injected into the exhaust stream. And as you continue flowing down the exhaust stream, you're going to find out that it will convert into an ammonia, and thus at that point will react to reduce the NOx. That's what we're trying to do. So the problem with our industry with diesels, as I move along here, please keep in mind, is there's just too many names for the same thing. We traditionally here in the United States have heard of DEF, which is diesel exhaust fluid, but it's also known as AdBlue in Europe, and we also call it reductant, urea, ammonia. Well, just to keep it simple, we'll stick to DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. Is a reducing agent for NOx? defined by US Car of North America, does have a standard and API certified, which is ISO 22241. It is a 32.5% solution of urea dissolved in deionized water, and it is pretty much the accepted fluid to be used with after treatment systems or SER systems on many diesel applications from small vehicle to heavy duty vehicle as well. So like I said already, as the last bullet is showing, it is also known as Add Blue. So again, DEF, Add Blue, that's all the same thing. Now what is urea SER? Def fluid urea or add blue reductant, like I said already, too many names were the same thing, but in this case, def fluid. It is the injection of this def fluid or reductant to convert engine out NOx into harmless N2 and H2O. Now, as I continue, we see all this pretty much these uh, letters that we see NH3, HNCO, and so on in H2O, which you guys know already is water, is that this cannot work properly unless it's heated. So as we look at these formulas of how it all splits and how it all changes into pretty much N2 and water, which is H2O, that's what we want coming out of the tailpipe when it comes to SER, is the fact that this cannot work properly unless we get hot. Now I will discuss this when I talk about DOCs and DPFs, but please keep in mind that it is important to realize that heat is very important in these exhaust systems and they can exceed over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So, Well here's a, pretty much the picture says it all. Um, you can see the exhaust stream and we see the, the DEF injector or reductant injector injecting this fluid of again water and urea and that immediately transforms into an ammonia to again to break up the NOx and thus reduce the NOx along with the NOx reducing catalyst. Now as you look very closely at this picture please keep in mind that when pretty much DEF fluid does dry up it does crystallize. So one of the common problems we see with the SER systems is the fact that this nozzle or this injector gets clogged and in many cases will cause false codes for um, inadequate NOx reduction or also claiming that the fluid is not up to standard or up to par. So there is pretty much people mixing their own, probably putting water in there or putting other liquids in there to try not to use DEF fluid, but the bottom line is we need to make sure we have a good quality DEF. So just to give you a quick um, 
diagnostic tip, uh, please go ahead and remove the injector using the scan tool and instructions. You can do a pretty much a fluid uh, level check. In other words, how much fluid is being injected if it's giving the minimum according to the use of the special functions or some type of bike uh, directional control of that injector which at that point once you take the fluid measurement you can take that fluid and use a refractometer that is now available and test the quality of that death fluid to make sure that the customer or a fleet operator has not put anything in more inferior in other words using good quality def and one more tip too as well is that make sure that that fluid is not expired many manufacturers of death fluid are now putting a date code on the bottle of the death fluid wherever it comes in so make sure that that death fluid is not out of date the average shelf life of death fluid is pretty much one year now there are some things to keep in mind especially using water with urea is the fact that it can freeze so 32.5 percent solution of urea freezes at 13 degrees fahrenheit minus 11 degrees celsius the government does require and mandates that injection occur as little as minus 30 degrees c which is somewhere right if my memory serves me right of minus 28 degrees fahrenheit and must deliver this to the exhaust in less than 30 minutes after start so i'm sure that areas of extreme cold are probably having issues because the heater used in the tank may not adequately melt in a timely manner so it might need assistance so modifications must be done to probably insulate or heat the urea tank it all depends on the application now as we switch gears here, talking about the diesel oxidation catalyst, I have viewed many different manuals from diesel manufacturers and we have found that uh, the diesel oxidation catalyst primarily plays one serious role and that is to promote a regeneration. This goes back to automotive applications that use gasoline engines and one of the things we were told was that you do not really like this engine to run rich on a gasoline application and the reason why is that the pretty much the hydrocarbon otherwise known as fuel or gasoline will react with the catalyst which were the catalyst materials were pretty much used platinum palladium and cerium and other uh, pretty much other components but those were the primary precious metals used in the catalyst but the bottom line was when you ran excessive fuel into the exhaust on a gasoline application it tend to overheat it you may have heard of maybe these catalysts getting cherry red and melt down well that was a bad thing now in diesel we're kind of contradicting that law and we're, what we are literally doing is bombarding that DOC or this diesel oxidation catalyst to have it chemically reaction occur and create a, a pretty much hellacious amount of heat which can exceed like I said earlier 1000 degrees Fahrenheit now please note if you're not familiar with the catalyst as themselves they all have a light off temperature and that light off temperature will be needed in order for it to do its job so as we can see in this slide on one end to the left you can see the hydrocarbon carbon monoxide particulate matter and then what exits once the catalyst has done its job is carbon dioxide particulate matter and water so it oxidizes the co into co2 but in a diesel its primary function on a after treatment system is to be mixed with fuel so we are injecting fuel into the exhaust believe it or not and at that point we're causing it to create heat and that'll help us incinerate the soot that is in the DPF and also aid in the S operation for heat. Now the reaction desoxidase catalysts promote chemical oxidation of CO and HC like we said already but like the slide is green you're welcome to read it, is the fact that we're just trying to get it hot um, but in this case there's also sulfate particles to keep in mind but for us for learning purposes please understand that you need to watch the additives you're using such as fuel additives oil additives um, those can have sulfur based compounds which also will not help in the catalyst and thus start to poison it oxidation is regarded as its name to its ability to promote oxidation of several exhaust gas components by oxygen which is present in ample quantities in the diesel exhaust so when passed over an oxidation catalyst the following diesel pollutants can be oxidized to harmless products and thus can be controlled using DOC carbon monoxide gas phase hydrocarbons organic fraction of diesel particulates better known as SOF and additional benefits of DOC include oxidation of several non-regulated AC derived emissions such as aldehydes or PAHs as well as reduction or elimination of the odor of diesel exhaust 
You know, that's something to keep in mind because I've seen demonstrations where you will find that some people will run a diesel truck with all these SCR and DOC and DPF and say that the air is cleaner coming out of the exhaust than what is in the air. That's not exactly true because there's other components like we just mentioned right now. So the bottom line is heat, okay? Heat, heat, heat. The truck has to be hot. You got issues with your DOC, DPF, or SCR, you need heat. So according to General Motors, which is one of the better books that I've seen on DOC, DPF, is that the diesel oxygen catalyst is designed to promote a regeneration event. It performs the functions mentioned, but heat is needed to perform the oxidation of the catalyst. And these light off temperatures that I measure, that I mentioned, are needed and that is minimum of somewhere around 585 to 580 degrees Fahrenheit so get it please get it and get it get it heat 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 we need heat so some things you will see now on the internet is the fact that now they're selling insulations for after treatment systems and the reason why is because you want to keep it hot one of the basic things we have done to promote heat is to actually use header wrap for headers exhaust headers we've used header wraps to insulate that heat and keep it in the exhaust system so like I said already, that light off temperature it occurs above 100, 590 degrees, which means does this catalyst do anything? Not really, under 590 degrees, no. Engine operating temperature will affect how soon the light off occurs, and that is very true. So one thing we see continuously is that many of these diesel engines will have pretty much thermostats stuck open. So heat is the main issue with catalysts. We have to get it hot, must maintain it hot. So as you look at this diagram or this picture right here, this is of a Dodge Cummins 2500, and you'll see the DOC and the DPF, and the DOC and the DPF are exposed to the elements of the air. In other words, imagine this truck in a zero degree area of snow, and then probably in the north, or up in higher altitudes, but the bottom line is, does this system ever get to reach the operating temperature that it needs? In other words, can we reach those light off temperatures of 590? Probably not. And Dodge is one of the worst ones that we have learned from our experiences. I'm not saying I'm correct, but it's one that we've seen from our experiences. So could you imagine insulating this DOC DPF? Will that pretty much encourage more heat so that the DOC can do its job and the DPF can have its suit that it's collected burnt? Oh, and by the way, as we talk about soot being burnt, remember, when we burn soot, it immediately will turn into ash, A-S-H, ash. So in this case, can a DPF eventually get ash loaded? The answer is yes. That is the life of a DPF according to the manufacturers. But like you will find out, there in the aftermarket, we see DOCs and DPFs serviced and reused. So as you look at the DPF, uh, the name, the third name says it all, diesel particulate filter, filter. Filter means that it is a serviceable item and it needs to be cleaned or replaced. In this case, the DPF has a set of channels that collects the soot, which in turn traps it, and eventually that soot will accumulate and we will have to go ahead and regenerate it. So the process of burning the soot is defined as regeneration. In other words, if somebody asks, hey, what's regeneration? Regeneration is the process of burning soup because you're regenerating this filter. Word to the wise though, please make sure that you view the exhaust tip of this exhaust system or after treatment system. Just look at the exhaust tip. If it's black and full of soot, there's pretty much a 99.9% .9 chance that you have an open channel in the filter. In other words, the filter has a hole through it and soot is escaping, which pretty much means that the DPF is no good and therefore the DPF will need to be replaced. Diesel particulate filter, like we said already. It's an exhaust stream, usually downstream of the DOC. Well, it's always downstream of the DOC. The reason why is because you can have, like a Ford Power Stroke 6.7 can have a DOC, a DPF and then SER or DOC, SER then DPF and their order has they go downstream of the exhaust. Can vary. It is made of a porous catalytically coated silicone carbide material that traps those particulates or soot. Completely eliminates the exhaust smoke even through sudden accelerations and rapid driving changes. So here's the problem. It's a great thing. It's a good thing. It does trap particulates. It is doing its job. But the question is, could you have a drivability problem such as an engine injector turbo boost issue, which in turn will hide the smoke and you don't know you have a problem? 
Well, if you're a good tech, you will pretty much know what to look at in the data or look at diagnostic trouble that may have set, but can a DPF along with a DOC hide a problem that the engine might have? Let me give you an example. Have you ever had a truck come in that runs great but just pretty much emits a lot of black smoke on an older vehicle? Yeah. It runs great, but it's just putting out a lot of black smoke. Can the same thing happen on these trucks equipped with these after treatment systems? Yeah, the answer is yes. Oh, here's that one we were just talking about. I kind of did that on purpose here, but you will notice that we have the DOC, the DPF, and then SER on the first model, which is cabin chassis trucks for these Power Stroke 6.7s. Well, the pickup models have the DOC, SER, and then the DPF. So again, this is pretty much hoping that you understand that in order for all this to work, A, it must have a good running engine, and B, no sulfur-based or exotic oil additives and fuel additives, and uh, pretty much getting up to speed, meaning that it's running hot and its temperature is supposed to run at. I'm not going to read this whole slide and you're welcome to pause and read it, but please note that um, a diesel particulate filter is a device designed to reduce that particulate matter. Yes, I'm repeating stuff. And in this case, that's the soot. Wall flow diesel particulate filters usually remove 85% or more of the soot. And under certain conditions, can attain soot removal efficiencies of close to 100%. So in this case, um, they do work very well. Like I said, check that exhaust tip, make sure it's not full of soot. And as we read towards the bottom, it says their engine programming to run when the filter is full in a manner that elevates exhaust temperature, produces high amounts of NOx, toxicized accumulated ash, or through other methods. This is known as filter regeneration. So please keep that in mind. But to make it simple, regeneration. I said is the process of burning soot. Now there are three different types of regeneration. Imagine that truck that is towing a gooseneck trailer with four cars on it or three cars, whatever. As that truck is going up and down the highway, in other words, going up and down um, hills, in this case, can we see that the uh, heat can be so hot and exhaust just by the engine working under load that it's enough to burn the soot? That is better known as passive. So the over-the-road truck under a continuous load is the perfect candidate for these systems. It's that stop-and-go truck or that average city-driven truck that may have issues, which brings up the next type of regeneration, which is active. The PCM will use a strategy to run post-injections in order to create heat in the DOC. So that means that the computer is going to go ahead and take over the situation and we're going to put fuel. So as you remember from previous slides, I told you that a DOC needs fuel to chemically react and generate a lot of heat. How do we do that? Post-injections. Now please note, uh, newer trucks like the new LML used on Duramax, they now have a dedicated, we call it the ninth injector, they call it the hydrocarbon injector. In other words, we have now have in the exhaust manifold on the passenger side a dedicated injector to inject the fuel into the exhaust, while other models, or earlier models, were running uh, pretty much post-injections. What is post-injections? You're injecting fuel as that piston approaches exhaust stroke and the exhaust valve is open so we're pushing fuel into the exhaust yes that's what i said we are literally pushing fuel into the exhaust wait out of that two dollars or three dollars a gallon that i'm paying for fuel we're injecting that fuel into the exhaust stream without even using it for combustion yes that is part of your regeneration in active mode Lastly, there's manual. You as a technician will command with the use of the scan tool to run a manual regeneration. You need a scan tool that can allow you to run it. Now, if you're dealing with a GM, there might be inhibits. Inhibits means that it will not allow it to run for some reason. Maybe it runs too long, it's too hot, uh, maybe not in gear, parking brake issue. Uh, if you're working with a Ford, Fords tend to be more easy to run manual because they pretty much tell you if it's clean, part loaded or loaded, while a Dodge is probably the biggest nightmare that we have experienced on 6.7 Cummins applications because you will require a code to be set to run a manual regeneration, so that makes it a little bit harder. So as I said already, as we review these regenerations, passive means heat generated from normal exhaust may be sufficient to burn the soot in the particulate filter. Like I said already, over the road trucks were allowed this to happen. And active regeneration is again, when passive does not attain, it doesn't get hot enough. So again, there goes that heat again. We're trying to burn the soot. And what do we need once again? We need heat. 
So at this moment, the piston is traveling to top dead center exhaust stroke. Again, we push fuel, so it'll push it out into the exhaust stream. So in this case, eventually it'll get down to the DOC Will it cause heat to be generated through the chemical reaction of fuel, in this case diesel fuel, with the DOC. At that point, that heat will be used to incinerate the particulate matter in the DPF. Now note, different diesel applications now have the DOC, the DOC or the HC injector. No more post injections like I just mentioned on the Duramax. So other applications, probably CAT or Cummins may have their own way of doing it, but um, not all of them now are using post injections. But on the light duty trucks, many are still using it. For example, on the Power Stroke 67, the driver's side head cylinders, in other words, five, six, seven, and eight on the driver's side will now be performing post injections so they're still doing that but on Duramax no they're not but on Dodge they still are too as well running post injections on all cylinders so note number 14 there you go we got an LML Duramax here if there's the fuel system look at number 14 that is the hydrocarbon injector so it's not using the high rail pressure it's in the return side so you pretty much you'll notice that that injector is used so to recap active regeneration again as step one says heat exhaust gas entering the DOC to a temperature above 662 degrees by the way that's light off step two introduce a late post injection fuel to oxidize the DOC to heat the exhaust to a temperature above 500 degrees or 932 degrees we pretty much say a thousand degrees uh, please note the reality is that is it possible that you run a regenerator and within minutes you will go over 1200 degrees yes that can happen and you got to keep your eye on it obviously the system will kick you out if you get too hot but Duramaxes from our experiences have been more apt to require hotter temperatures to reduce the suit model and I'll explain the suit model later but in this case I could reach over a thousand degrees plus to 1400 degrees uh, real quickly, I don't want to leave you hanging dry here, is that suit model is the quantity of grams that the computer guesses that is in the DPF. And that is a guess. It's a calculation, if I want to talk more technical. But it's a calculation that the computer says, hey, there's so much grams of particulate matter or soot in that DPF to pretty much help him keep track of how much there is in there. So when he decides that if those temperatures are not attained and it's not heated, then therefore he's going to be forced to do an active regeneration. Obviously, to take it a step further, is if the active regeneration is not attained, then at that point we will see reduced engine operation and probably see a diagnostic trouble code set and a check engine light on. Now remember, you do have some control, manual regeneration. So when passive and active regeneration cannot be achieved, the PCM ECM will display a message or a light and or some type of code set depending on the make, make of the vehicle. And this message will indicate that the PCM ECM is requesting a manual regeneration. Now, the reality is that, you know, if you're running post injections quite frequently, think about this. If you're post injecting, are you wasting fuel, which means that the customer is going to complain about poor fuel economy. So wouldn't it be a good idea that every time this truck comes in for a service such as an A service or a B service, in other words, an oil change, would it be a good idea to run a regeneration using the scandal before we change the oil? Again, before we change the oil, the answer is yes. Because if we completely dedicate time to burn all this soot, what's the likelihood of this truck going into active regeneration and reducing fuel economy and uh, pretty much causing the customer to be unhappy. So please keep in mind that you may want to consider doing regenerations if the truck needs service or comes in for service. Just to give you a good idea what the computer strategy is, uh, you can see that the computer keeps a suit model or a, pretty much a log of how many times this truck has started, the load it is under, and also the temperatures using the exhaust gas temperature sensors in the exhaust. And he'll come up with a conclusion how much suit loaded the DPF is. So as you can see in the sample chart, 75-85% suit loading, the diesel particulate filter lamp is off, in other words, the warning, aka known as a clean exhaust filter message. 100% loading, normal DPF loading to trigger regen, the lamp is still off. In other words, he's still trying to run an active if not a passive is not attained. 
Finally, at 100% suit loading, DPF lamp on to inform customer. Customer has the ability to take action. You may see some type of message that says drive on highway to try to help regen process. Ford has their own message. Other manufacturers have their message. But at 175% suit loading, the mill lamp is on and engine limp home or service is needed. So I guess what we're trying to illustrate here is if you have a truck that comes in and this thing is flashing every type of message, a mill lamp, and it's in limp mode, the likelihood of saving that DPF may not look good. It looks grim because of the simple fact that it's so heavily loaded with DPF, with, excuse me, with soot. And in this case, that DPF will may need to be replaced if not serviced. Now we were talking about um, pretty much the sensors, the I said exhaust gas temperature sensor there. You can see pre-DPF's temperature sensor on the bottom and post-DPF temperature sensor. You'll see the two metal lines going to the delta pressure sensor. Uh, not all delta pressure sensors are the same. Uh, some delta pressure sensors may have only one tube, which is before the DPF and just exposed atmospheric pressure on the other side, which is, will work too. But he, what, it's, what we're trying to do here is measure the differences between, or the pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet of the DPF. So you will see that there is, again, a line right there measuring that pressure difference. So would it be fair to say that the DPS, or the delta pressure sensor, is used to find out if the DPS is starting to become clogged? The answer is yes. Now many books, now here I'm going to get some people mad at me, but many books out there have pretty much said that the DPS is the primary sensor for uh, determining when a regeneration is needed. Well, that's true, but it's also using the temperature sensors. But let me give an example here so you hope you can understand. Is it always true that it lies on a DPS? Well, I got a phone call from a technician, and we were, he's, he says, Tony, I need your help here. He says, I know what I did wrong, but before we get into that, I want you to tell me why the computer is acting the way it's acting, in other words, the ECM or PCM. And I said, okay, what's going on? He says, the truck came in, had a clogged DPF. I did all my diagnosis, blah, blah, blah. But it pretty much came to down to that the DPF is just too clogged. It won't regen. Okay, fine. I replaced it. Now, I know what I did wrong. I forgot to reset the DPF counter. In other words, DPF reset because you need to let the computer know that you have a new DPF in there. He reset it. He says, I didn't do it, but I got a new DPF and I took the truck down the road. He says, within minutes of driving it, Immediately, the computer went into reduced engine mode and also set the check engine light on and code was set. And it was for a loaded DPF. He was, my question is, you know, I'm looking at the scan data and I'm looking at the delta pressure reading and it's reading a big fat zero, a donut. Even though the computer sees zero pressure on the inlet outlet of that DPF, why is it that it's still requesting a regeneration? The answer is, is because he's got a soot model. We mentioned that soot model. In other words, he's calculated from his calculations that, hey, I have consumed so much fuel. That means I've run these different loads and I've taken these different temperatures. The computer's at the opinion that even though the delta pressure sensor is telling him zero, he still thinks that, you know, the DPF is loaded because of his soot model. So I guess what we're trying to say is when you replace a DPF, you need to reset the DPF counter, the DPF, um, some type of DPF log that tracks how many grams of soot are accumulated in DPF. So, which means that who is the main input for the computer in reality? That would be the fuel level sensor, aka known as the fuel sending unit, because the computer keeps track on how many gallons of fuel you have consumed. And with so many gallons, so many loads, so much temperature, the computer uses its algorithms to compute, hey, this is how much soot is in the DPF. So these sensors play a key role. Again, these are all equipped on 2007 and later models. The EGT, better known as exhaust gas temperature sensor, and that differential pressure sensor, or DPS, as we talked about earlier. Now remember, the exhaust gas temperature is very critical. Um, if you're working on a PAR stroke 6.4, for example, if you disconnect that sensor, that sensor has a short inside, it may cause a no crank, no start condition. 
in this case we got to watch out for that so one thing you need to with a four power stroke six seven if it don't want to crank you may want to excuse me crank no start you may want to go ahead and look at your scan data and look at your edts and understand that it can all be you know all there so as we look at the exhaust gas temperature sensor it supplies the PCMECM with the temperature in the exhaust. Remember, it could be from downstream, uh, upstream to downstream, meaning that you got one, two, three, or four, or in some cases, five sensors. Uh, Preconditioning is required to attain light off temperatures in the exhaust. So that's what the computer uses to monitor. And it also, you need to observe these temperatures as you run a uh, regeneration event. Uh, I guess this is important to mention because you want to make sure that this DPF is not overheating. So when you get temperatures above 1400 degrees that becomes dangerous. So here's a good view of your DOC but the white arrows pointing at an oxygen sensor used on Dodge Commons applications but those were on the early model 6.7s. But uh, the black arrow is pretty much pointing to the tube that goes upstream to the DPS. Uh, word to the wise though, these systems do not tolerate any exhaust leaks, so if you do remove the flanges or these systems, please make sure the gasket is intact. If not, you need to replace it. So like we said already, the DPS sensor compares the inlet and outlet of the DPS and the pressure difference. So that it supplies information to help the computer pretty much know the content or the amount of soot accumulated in the DPF. Here you can see a better view of those sensors. Number three is the differential pressure sensor. Uh, you can see the exhaust gas temperature sensor one and two on four and five and pretty much your DOC and your DPF. So when to regenerate? Well we already mentioned this but we'll just review it again. How does the computer know when to run an active regeneration? Uh, the DPS pressure, like we said already, and the amount of fuel that has been consumed. So you need to make sure that the fuel gauge does work, so is the fuel level sensor working, the loads that the engine has been under, the temperature, both ambient and engine, oil and exhaust. And the PCM ECM on many trucks will calculate a suit model, and this suit model is usually displayed in the scan tool as in grams. They could vary a little bit depending on applications, but it mostly is in grams from what we have seen on the light duty trucks. So here you could see a view of a Star Mobile or WI Tech data and as the yellow arrow points to you can see that the estimated suit level on delta pressure shows 34.906 grams. Now there's no magical menu out there or scan tool that tells you how much is too much of uh, suit accumulation but we primarily use 30. If it's 30 grams or more we're going to try to run a regeneration and uh, reduce the amount of active regenerations as the truck's going down the road. So like I said already, is it always the DPS? And so like I said already, no. The factors can be that it is also uh, pretty much the uh, reading of how much fuel is consumed. But the reality is, what is the overall condition of the engine? Are you burning excessive oil? Is there oil dilution? Injectors, I mean, what are they doing? I mean, we got a lot of aftermarket junk being sold out there. Low compression, low boost, excessive blow-by gases, crankiest gases. Do these all contribute to a shortened DPF life or an SER problem? The answer is yes. So the bottom line is, you got to check that oil. I mean, engine oil is so critical that it needs to be checked. And if it's diluted, that's probably indicating that we're running too many re active regenerations, which means that that fuel is diluting the oil because it works its way around the rings and into the crankcase where the oil is at. So if you want to diagnose a truck, it is a wise idea to know how the engine is running. So what we say is uncork it, meaning run the engine with the after treatment system removed to check for any signs of excess smoke. Uh, if it's smoking real bad, that's telling you that's the reason why. For example, we had a partial 64 that was smoking excessively when we uncorked it. Turns out that we had oil coming out of the turbo. So when we remove the outlet of the, of the turbo, we, that goes to the charge air cooler, turns out there was a lot of oil being spit into it. So that was causing our frequent regenerations. But also check the DOC for carbon. When you remove it and you uncork it, you'll be able to stick a camera or a flashlight to as well and look at the inlet of DOC, see if it's not formed a carbon wall. It looks like a potato chip, a thin carbon wall on the inlet of that DOC, which will cause the DOC not to let it get hot. 
And what about smoke when you're doing a regeneration? Here's a picture of a truck running in a manual regeneration. Why would smoke be present? Well, it can get darker. That one's a nice picture, but some of them, they, they could get really dark. And this is pretty much indication of poisoning, such as the wrong oil additive and fuel additive, as we discussed already. The oil is also important. Now, I'm not a fan, you know, some of, I'm going to get some backlash on it, but I'm not a fan of synthetic oil when it comes to after treatment systems and those trucks equipped with it and extended oil change intervals for the simple reason that if you're doing active regenerations, are you possibly going to dilute that oil? Yeah, but for starters, please understand you're supposed to use CJ-4 approved motor oil. It is a certified low ash oil. You're going to look for that symbol. Oil is no longer 15W40 also on many applications. We have 1030, 030, 040 being used. So make sure you pay attention to the cap. If not, look at the owner's manual or our service information on what the proper oil to use. But it is 15W40 still used on many applications. But let's keep in mind, oil additives, are they cat friendly? Check and call your supplier and uh, those fuel additives can also affect as well. We talked about the engine, thermostat stuck open, makes it run cold. Remember we said, got to run it hot? Uh, the fuel trim's out of range. I mean, those balancing rates, are, where are they at? Are we overfueling? Do we have leaky injectors? Or does the engine have a mechanical problem caused by low compression, turbo oil leaks, like I mentioned already on a power stroke 6.4, boost issues? So you cannot just service or replace a DPF without knowing what caused the death of that DPF. So inspect the rest of the engine. What is it doing? Use, a, use of the service information is critical. So if you have codes, you know, I get so many calls about codes, you know, everybody wants the magical answer. No, you just got to test it. Bottom line, test it. And read the conditions that can set the code to set. So in other words, read the code chart. It won't take long. It's all on the internet. And depending on what service information you got, you got access to it. Resetting and issues, what do we mean by that? Well, certain models of vehicles have various resetting procedures, but oil dilution is due to frequent regeneration, like we said already, which can lead to premature engine failures. But what happens is that many guys will reset the DPF counter even though they haven't reset or, re excuse me, replaced or regenerated the current DPF. In other words, they replace it and they, boy, I'm off here. No, what I mean is the truck comes in, <laughs> I'm going to get this right. The DPF, the truck comes in, the, it's got multiple codes, and they're all DPF related, and the technician needs to get the truck out. So what many cheat and do, which is a big no-no, is that they reset the DPF counter to let the computer think that it's got a brand new DPF when it does it. So that's a big no-no. So issues can involve bias sensors, programming issues, yes, programming issues, and the way the truck is driven. What are those driver habits? So that's pretty much it on this short presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at service at lasvegasdiesel.com. That is our business, which is powertrain performance. Uh, you can also call me, leave a message on my cell, which is 702-235-4504. Uh, make sure you, again, you pay attention, reread, or if you have any questions, please email me. But understand, heat and the right oil and short, short oil intervals will pretty much set the stage for longer life on these systems. Thanks for watching.